Hi, welcome to the uh, Fullerton Museum Center. My name is Richard Smith and I'm the curator of the, uh, the museum and as, uh, the Leo Fender Gallery, which is a, a part of the museum. About three or four months ago, a very, very interesting early Fender guitar walked in. Um, the serial number on it is 0095, and if you're a student of vintage Fender guitars, you know that the uh, early guitars were all out of whack as far as the order of the serial numbers. So it doesn't really tell us a whole lot, but as soon as I looked at the other features of the guitar, I knew for sure that this was, in fact, a very early guitar and a very important one because it represented a step in the thinking of Leo Fender and what he really had in mind when he went to develop his solid body guitar. To the casual observer, it might look like just another Fender guitar, but in fact, it is one of the very first Fender guitars ever made and sold here in Fullerton, uh, in, well, for that matter, in the whole world. Uh, Leo Fender had his factory here in Fullerton in 1950, and Arliss McMahon told a story about he and his dad going down to, uh, to the Fender factory and buying this guitar directly from Leo Fender. Well, why is this guitar important? Well, historically, the Fender guitar is uh, something that was really part of the soundtrack of rock and roll and the soundtrack of popular music for the entire uh, last 60 years. Uh, this guitar represents one of the very first ones, so it's, 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 uh, it's interesting in its uniqueness. It's built in ways that the uh, production model, it really truly was a prototype, or a very close to being a prototype. What was different? Well, for one thing, this guitar is not truly solid. Leo Fender is famous for developing the first commercially successful solid body guitar, but in reality, this guitar, you can tell when you tap around the sides through the middle of the guitar, is actually chambered. The inside of the guitar is semi-hollow. The inside of the body was, was hollowed out and then it was sandwiched together. And so we call it a, a sandwiched pine body or a, uh, uh, one that has the, uh, the chambered body. Now that made the guitar both lighter and uh, it gave it a different resonance, I think. When we plug this guitar in, it sounds like a Fender, but it sounds a little bit different than a commercial Telecaster. The, the Telecaster, like we're going to look at in a couple of minutes, this is a 52 Telecaster. It actually has a solid body that's made out of ash as opposed to the, to the sandwich body, which is made out of pine. So all of that adds up to a slightly different tone. The other unique thing about this uh, guitar is the neck. Very few of the Fender necks without truss rods have ever been seen. I think that there's probably, I, I personally have seen six or seven. And uh, so it's, if it falls into that category, which this one definitely falls into, you can tell, because it doesn't have the skunk stripe on the back, it's just plain maple wood. If it falls into the category of non-truss rod, you know that it's early, you know that it's rare. This particular guitar was bought in, uh, in 1950, made in early 1950. The date codes on these controls in the uh, control cavity indicate that it, the pots were made in the sixth week of 1950. This guitar was built for certain in 1950 because by the end of 1950, they, they had uh, updated the design. The switch is conventional for a Fender Esquire as it was uh, produced in the 50s. But you'll notice the inside of the control cavity was actually enlarged. The theory is that there was no switch on this guitar originally, or at least that was the initial design, was to have no switch on the single pickup guitar. Leo has at some point in time changed that idea and went ahead with the switch. And uh, the capacitors in here, it's really the same as the commercially available Esquire later in the 50s, the same wiring setup. So there's nothing really unique about the wiring. Uh, on the headstock, we know that the, the initial uh, Telecaster broadcaster had these uh, original string retainers, uh, such as this guitar has, but I think that that was uh, something that was added as an afterthought. I think the original one in the catalog, in 1950 at least, shows no string tree. So I think that this was probably added at some point in time. The pick guard is not the same shape. It's very close, but it's not the same shape. It was not made on the same template as this pick guard on a 52 Telecaster. 
So let's compare the two just in that regard. You'll notice that this one has two pickups. Well, of course it has two pickups. It's a Telecaster. Originally, the, uh, the Esquire had one pickup. Then there was a two pickup version of this. And then, of course, they changed the name from, broad, from Esquire to Broadcaster for the two pickup model. And then Gretsch uh, requested that they stop using the uh, Broadcaster name because the name Broadcaster was a trademark of the Gretsch company. And so they had to change the name. They chose the name Telecaster. Now, there's some no real confusion about that because we have all of the paperwork, the, uh, the announcements for uh, to the salesman that the name had been dropped and what the name would, would be. And, they, they did suggest that they have a contest, a name, uh, a naming contest with the Telecaster, but they didn't go through with that. Okay, we have the uh, no truss rod in the neck. We have the high string retainer. We have the very early Cluson tuners that are closed in back. And I suspect they also say patent pending in there somewhere. These tuners are going to be open in back. Yes, they are open. You can see the shaft comes through. So that is one slight for all of you screw chasers out there. We want to know that every little detail, that one is pretty self-evident. Now, the other thing that I've noticed about the neck is the way the nut is cut. It doesn't seem to be the same width as the later commercially uh, available one. It's a little lighter, a little shorter, and, uh, and, and cut with a little round curve on the top. It's very interesting. I think that the it probably just proved to be not as substantial as the... Uh, is the larger one that they used. Okay, the frets. You know, of course, Leo developed a, a unique machine for fretting these guitars. The frets were not pounded in like this. They were actually installed with a machine that pulled them through. Then they were snipped off the side, and then it was finished smooth on the side. Uh, you can notice that on this guitar as well, that the fretting was done in a similar fashion. Now. This is my question for Fender. They were so kind as to produce this copy. This is made in 2012, and it's virtually identical to the old ones. But I'm not sure how they actually installed the frets on this one. We'll have to ask them to find out for sure. I know it sure plays good, plays well, rather, and it sounds terrific in the Fender tradition, of course. Now, the pickup uh, mounting plate has the single slot screws uh, that adjust the pickup up and down. And they have the steel bridge pieces, which is, if you have a broadcaster with steel bridge pieces, you know that that's original. Uh, a few were made like that as well. All the Esquires that I've seen that predate the, uh, the broadcaster have the steel bridge pieces. Dome knobs and this regular strap holders. The, uh, the body appears to be made from the same from the same template that the, uh, that the 52 was made on. You can see the detail here in the cutaway. There's a little overhang and there's a little bump. And that's typical of, of all the Telecasters from that period. Besides Arliss's uh, Esquire 0095, the band also had the first dual pickup Fender Esquire, which was 0009. Uh, that was played by Harold Courtright. Uh, they had number three precision bass that uh, Jack played, and they also had uh, the very early dual professional amplifier, uh, one of the very earliest pro TV front pro amps. Of course, uh, Fireball and Kay played Fender Steels and had Fender amps as well. So this is quite a little bit of musical history here. I hope everybody enjoyed it.